Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm a pathologist. I've been at the FDA and OIR for three years. And today I'm going to try to help you understand when you need an IDE, how do you know when you need an IDE. Um, I think the rules for that are relatively simple. Uh, sometimes they're easy to apply, sometimes they're not, and we'll get into that. So from our um, uh, Code of Federal Regulations, um, a significant risk device is defined as an invest investigational device that, and we, for in, in vitro diagnostic devices, we use really parts three and four of this definition. Uh, so it's for use of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or otherwise preventing impairment uh, of human health, and presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a subject, or otherwise presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, or welfare of the subject. Now, there are different types of devices, um, and we want to make a clear distinction here between in vitro diagnostic devices, which is what we deal with and what we're talking about today, versus implanted devices. Now, in, in an implanted device, it's very simple. If you have a prosthetic heart valve, the risk of the trial is the same as the risk of the device. It's very easy. It's different for in vitro diagnostic devices. The risk of the trial depends on how the information generated by the device is used. So, um, there's a distinction that doesn't really have to be made between the, the device and the trial because the determination is really based on both. The risk determination question for in vitro diagnostic devices is, what is the risk of the use of this device in this specific trial? So the use of the identical device, one device can be either significant risk or non-significant risk depending on how it's used in the trial. And you can have two trials using the same device one would be an SR trial, the other would be an NSR trial. Um, I want to bring up something that Dr. Khan raised earlier. Uh, he mentioned um, a device master file. Um, if you show us a device and you give us all possible information about it, we can't tell you if it's SR or NSR unless you tell us how it's being used in a trial. But if you're using a single device in multiple trials, uh, you can make it easier on yourself and on us uh, if you submit a device master file. And then trial by trial, if you need an IDE for a trial, you can send in that IDE and reference the, the analytical validation data in the master file. Um, that's just one way uh, of sort of simplifying the process if you're in that situation. Now, uh, I'm a pathologist, as I said. Uh, I deal mainly with uh, companion diagnostic devices for oncology trials. I'm not a molecular biologist. Uh, uh, but the general principles that I'm going to give you in these ex oncology and drug examples, um, the same general principles apply to genomics devices. Uh, we use the same rules. Uh, there, there may be some uh, finer points that some of the other people today can get into. Uh, but uh, I'm going to give you the basic rules that we use in the oncology trials. And there are basically four questions, uh, four key questions with respect to risk. First, uh, will the results from the device be used for enrollment? Second, will the results from the device cause patients to forego known, effective, or approved therapy? Third, will the results from the device cause patients to be subjected to unacceptable toxicities? And fourth, will the results from the device cause patients to undergo a potentially high-risk biopsy? There's one additional question that we usually don't have to address because there's usually not enough data uh, from drug trials, but sometimes there is, and um, based on available data, is there a known biomarker effect? with respect to either toxicity or effectiveness. If there is a known effect, then the use of the device could uh, be a risk by increasing toxicity or diverting a patient from more effective therapy. Well, there are certain things that we don't consider at all in a risk determination. We don't consider benefit. Um, we only look at risk. Now, as David uh, indicated earlier, in the evaluation of an IDE, we do look at risk and benefit. Uh, but the question of whether you need an IDE a potential benefit is not uh, part of that equation. It's only risk. Another thing we don't consi uh, consider is the number of patients at risk. Um, if you have a trial with three patients in it, uh, it's not NSR just because you have three patients. Uh, we, we undergo the, the same decision-making process regardless of the number of patients in the trial. Uh, incorrect exclusion from a trial uh, would not 
be considered a risk because we would expect management of that patient to re revert to standard of care. So what do you need for a risk determination for an in vitro diagnostic device? Well, we'd like to see a complete clinical trial protocol. This would, of course, include the inclusion and exclusion criteria, proposed interventions based on the, the device, how is the in vitro diagnostic device used to make decisions about treatment uh, or enrollment? We'd like a general understanding of the device and sampling requirements. Um, now, I, I have a black box here, and I, I use that black box intentionally. Uh, when I downloaded this presentation last night onto my iPhone, this box was green. I'm glad that it's, it's black right now. Uh, but, you know, it's a black box because, we, you know, the truth is we don't really look much at the details of the device in this risk determination. We look at the device output uh, and how the information is being used. So very simply, uh, a device will give you, say, a marker negative or a marker positive result. If that result is used for enrollment or arm assignment or stratification or other purposes, uh, that will determine uh, the level of risk and whether the uh, study is significant or non-significant risk. Um, the most, the simplest uh, example of an NSR trial is a device where the output is used purely for exploratory purposes. The information is not being used to drive anything, and, uh, is not being used to put patients in a particular arm of the trial or drive treatment. Um, so if it's purely for expl exploratory, uh, most likely uh, a trial like that would be an NSR trial. Now, if the device output is used as a criterion of enrollment, then the, the, the device exposes the patient to all the risks of being in the trial. And these risks could include uh, foregoing known effective therapy, drug toxicities, or new biopsies performed solely for trial purposes. A trial might be stratified using known or suspected prognostic indicators, for example, age, gender, or smoking history. And if the device output is used purely for stratification within trial arms, then this would not change the risks to which the patient is exposed, and that would generally uh, be an NSR trial. However, um, sometimes uh, you have, for example, uh, a trial where subjects are accrued without respect to device results until, let's say, 50 marker negatives are enrolled, and subsequent to that point, only marker positives will be enrolled. Well, that, the determination with that would be the same as a marker-based enrollment, uh, that, and that would determine uh, that the risk of that would be determined by what happens to the patient based on the, the test. So let's say you have a trial where patient everybody's enrolled, uh, but arm A, you put marker positives, and arm B, you have marker negatives. Well, this would be an NSR trial, but only if there's equipoise, i.e., if the arms are both equal or of unknown risks. Uh, and that's sometimes true, but it's often not true. For example, if you have arm A and arm B, where arm A is an experimental agent, and arm B's uh, patients get standard of care treatment, which is known to be effective, anybody who's enrolled in arm A is going to forego known effective therapy. Therefore, an incorrect test result will potentially de deprive a patient of alternative effective therapy. And this would generally be classified as a significant risk trial. Now, the experimental agent might prove to be better than the standard of care, but it might be worse. We just don't know, so it's, it's clearly a risk. Now, um, there's a situation where uh, sometimes everybody in a trial gets standard of care, but the experimental agent is an add-on to standard of care. And in many situations, we, we consider this non-significant risk because everybody is getting standard of care. But there is an exception to this uh, uh, with regard to drug trials, uh, there are some situations where there's usually not a lot of information available about toxicity of experimental drugs, but sometimes we have enough information to know that, um, that a, an agent is particularly toxic or more toxic than what the patient would have otherwise received. So um, an arm, uh, a study where everybody gets standard of care, but in one arm the experimental agent uh, has expected severe toxicity. If the uh, arms are divided by marker positive, marker negative, in other words, if the test uh, determines which arm the patient's going to, this would be an SR trial. 
because the patients uh, would be going, uh, undergoing added toxicity beyond that expected uh, with standard of care agents. Okay, now I've used that phrase standard of care. Uh, we could probably talk all day long about what is standard of care. Um, uh, we, uh, in, in oncology and drug trials and companion diagnostic devices for uh, those trials, uh, we find NCCN guidelines very useful. Uh, they're not carved in stone. We know that standard of care does change, uh, but they are useful and we use them frequently. Uh, there are two things I'd like to point out about NCCN. NCCN guidelines, uh, they do use the uh, phrase uh, clinical trial uh, in, in various uh, parts of the guidelines. Now you'll note that on the bottom of every page of every guideline in every edition, you will see this uh, statement, clinical trials. NCC believes, NCCN believes that the best management of any cancer patient in, is in a clinical trial. Participation in clinical trials is especially encouraged. Well, that's fine. and. I'm not sure if everybody agrees with this, but this does not affect our risk determination. This um, does not mean that trial, all trials are safe or there is no risk. Uh, however, uh, elsewhere in the NCCN guidelines up here, for example, for uh, patients with renal cell carcinoma, if they have stage four surgically unresectable renal cell car carcinoma, first line therapy, uh, there are several options, one of which is clinical trial. Now we take this to mean that um, uh, that there really is no really good therapy uh, that the patient is going to forego. So, um, so, yeah. Okay. So that, again, that's, that's sort of one of the ways that we use the NCCN guidelines. Um, okay, biopsy risk. This, this is sometimes considered a, and can be a complicated question, uh, but it's important to recognize that um, if enrolled patients in a trial will undergo a biopsy beyond what would be considered standard of care for the sole purpose of development of the test or the device, then the risks of the biopsy are attributed to the device. So accordingly, a high-risk biopsy in this setting would generally warrant a significant risk determination. Now, every patient is different, and biopsy risk varies widely, and it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, these include the site of the procedure, the type of the procedure, uh, patient's disease and underlying health, and institutional experience and support capabilities. In the, t in the context of a clinical trial, the biopsy risk is controlled according to the clinical judgment of the healthcare providers. Now, just as examples of potentially high-risk biopsies, there's lung, mediastinum, brain, pancreas. These are generally sites that you don't want to biopsy unless you really have to. Uh, examples of biopsies that are likely low risk are, for example, skin, endoscopic gastrointestinal biopsies, and cervix. Now, we acknowledge that in studies, in these oncology studies of recurrent and end-stage cancers, the site that will need to be biopsied may not be known in advance, and it generally is not known in advance when the protocol is written. But it's important to keep in mind that a patient on a clinical trial using an investigational device should not undergo a high-risk biopsy solely device for device development unless there is an approved IDE. So, in summary, um, it's not the device that's high risk. It's not the trial that's high risk. It's, it depends on the specific use of the device in a specific trial. And again, the output of the device, uh, how the output of the device is used on a, in, a, in the trial. Uh, thank you. <laughs>